Hi, I am Henk Noorman, part-time professor in the field of industrial biotechnology at the Delft University of Technology. But most of my time I work at the company DSM as bioprocess developer and I gained a lot of experience with fermenter design. Today many products such as biofuels, antibiotics, enzymes and monomers for bioplastics are made with the help of microorganisms in large-scale fermenters. Typical dimensions of an industrial scale fermenter are a diameter of 4 to 6 meters and a height of 10 to 20 meters or even taller. In this picture you see two persons working deep down in the fermenter. They are surrounded by a huge spiral tube that is used for cooling of the fermenter. And this relates to the central topic of this movie, heat removal. This is a key factor that can limit the rate of the reaction in large-scale fermenters. I personally believe a very cool topic that illustrates how important transport phenomena are in practice. In fermentation processes usually a lot of heat is produced. This can easily be in the order of megawatts. This heat has to be removed. Because otherwise the temperature in the fermenter will quickly rise and the microorganisms will not survive. This is especially true in aerobic fermentations, where the process can be viewed as a controlled combustion of sugars, the common feedstock. The cooling water that is used to shuttle these megawatts out of the fermenter is usually not so much different in temperature compared to the liquid medium containing nutrients and the microorganisms, the so-called broth. The driving force for temperature transfer can be as low as 20 or even 10 degrees and therefore a good heat transfer design is needed. In this movie we will discuss different heat sources and sinks in the bioreactor. An important question is, what are the terms that make up the heat balance? The process reaction is the first and largest contributor. There is an easy rule of thumb to calculate this amount. For each mole of oxygen consumed, there is 450 kilojoules of heat produced. For anaerobic processes, usually this is a factor 10 lower, but because anaerobic fermentations are often carried out at a larger scale, with less area per volume available for cooling, cooling strategies are equally important. In stir-tank reactors, the second most important term of heat production is the impeller. Energy dissipation via the impellers can add another 10 to 30% of heat on top of the reaction heat. The advantage of a bubble column or the airlift loop reactor is then clear because they don't have an impeller. There can be other sources of heat as well, such as hot feed streams or hot gases that are introduced in the broth. An important sink of heat is the evaporation of water. The water evaporation can have an extra cooling effect. The resulting heat generated in the fermenter needs to be removed to attain a constant temperature in the medium in the reactor. This can be done in many different ways, for example via coils, the vessel wall, baffles, or via an external loop with a heat exchanger through which the heat is transferred to cooling water. We will have a look at the cooling coils first, mounted either as a long spiral inside the reactor or welded as half pipes at the outside wall. A series of three steps is required to transport heat from the broth via the coils to the cooling water. First there is a convective flow of heat from the bulk of the liquid to the coil. Secondly, there is transfer of liquid through a film outside the coil and conduction through the coil material and then transfer through a liquid film at the cooling water side. And thirdly, there is a convective flow away from the system via the cooling water. At this point we introduce two key terms. The heat transfer coefficient expressed in watts per square meter cooling area per Kelvin and the heat capacity with the units watts per Kelvin. You might wonder whether there are temperature gradients in the bulk of the broth in large fermenters. 
Well, this is not the case. It can safely be assumed that the bulk temperature inside the properly mixed fermenter is everywhere the same. What is then the relation between heat transfer through the coil and convection in the cooling water? As we have seen earlier, this can be described as a simple heat exchanger. Let us consider the transfer process in more detail. Cold water flows in and absorbs heat that is supplied through the wall of the coil. Under steady state conditions, the energy balance set up over a small section of the coil shows that convection and transfer are equal. We already know that the temperature of the broth is constant. That means that the wall temperature of our heat exchanger is also constant. In practice, the Stanton number is an important dimensionless quantity in the design of a cooling system. It represents the ratio of the total heat transfer through the coil and the heat capacity of the cooling fluid. In an ideal situation, the Stanton number should be close to 1. If it is much lower than 1, then you have an overcapacity of the cooling water flow, meaning that the temperature of the cooling water at outflow is not much different than at inflow. And if the Stanton number is much higher than 1, say about 10, then the opposite is true. There is a bottleneck in the cooling water flow and the outlet temperature of the cooling water approaches the temperature inside the fermenter. This also happens when the cooling area is too large compared to the flow of cooling liquid, for example when the coil is too long. For very large fermenters, the maximum available cooling area per unit volume, which equals 4 divided by the tank diameter, will become too small for adequate cooling and an external cooling loop needs to be installed for removal of the surplus heat. The great advantage of external cooling is that you have greater design freedom, meaning that more heat can be transferred. Using a cooling coil may result in a few degrees lower temperature in the thin liquid film on the broth side, but in comparison the external loop can easily generate 5 degrees of cooling for all broth elements every 10 or 20 minutes. External cooling loops also present challenges. The microorganisms have to be capable of handling the cold shocks, which are more severe than with cooling coils. Also, there is a relatively high shear rate in the transport pump, which can cause damage to the microorganisms. Another disadvantage is that you need a special type of pump that will prevent contamination which requires a good capital investment as well as extra costs for electricity and maintenance. For example, the cooling requirement of the fermentation of glucose to 1,3-propane diol, the so-called PDO process, is approximately 51 megajoule per second. Using this value, we are able to calculate all the key design elements, including the required volume flow rate through the cooling loop. Assuming a temperature difference of 5 degrees over the loop, then a cooling water flow of 2.46 meter cubed per second is needed. On average, the organisms pass the loop every 15 minutes, although some cells may pass more frequently, and others only incidentally. Finally, a good design is essential for sufficient cooling at minimum costs. In large reactors, the total heat production rate can be high and requires a heavy-duty cooling system to keep the temperature in the fermentation at the desired value. Evaporation can be a useful heat sink to reduce the cooling needs, and you should not forget heat that is produced via the impeller in stirred tanks. There can be hot spots in your large-scale reactor, for example close to the inlet points of hot gas or hot feed liquid. And together with cold spots in the external cooling loops, this can have a serious impact on the performance of the microbes. One example is that the cells have a temperature sensitive switch for making the desired product. Then you should take care that product formation stays at level. In addition, long residence times in the loop can result in oxygen and substrate starvation. And this should be avoided with a proper design. So thanks for your attention 
And those of you who are interested in more about fermenters, please take a look at the MOOC of Industrial Biotechnology from the TU Delft.